Acts 13, verse 20 through 23. Acts 13, verse 20 through 23. And stand on your feet for the reading of God's word. I love you back. I love you back. They tried to keep me up in Washington, but I told them I had to get home to Dallas. Amen. Never get so road conscious that you're not home centered. Amen. That's a word right there. That's a word right there. Okay. The subject this morning is bridges to destiny. That's what we're going to talk about today, bridges to destiny. Every person in this room has a destiny, but you'll never walk into it until you find your bridge. Every person in this room has a destiny beyond what you planned on, but you'll never find it until you find your bridge. And when you start talking about bridges to destiny, they show up in the strangest way. Let's take a look at this word. This is, this is Luke writing in the book of Acts, and he's summarizing hundreds of years of history, and, and, and I just wanted to pick up at the 20th verse. All this took about 450 years. He talked about the children of Israel being in Egypt, and, and from the time that, Mo, that God spoke to Abraham up until the time and said that your children will sojourn in Egypt for 400 years, and afterwards they will come out with great substance. God never lets you go through anything that you don't come out afterwards with great substance. Yeah, great substance. I think it's important that you go through something before you get great substance so you appreciate it. I find that people who get things too easily discard them too easily. And I was, preaching in, I was preaching up in Washington this week about Moses dropping the two tablets of stone. When God hewed them out the rock and when God wrote on them, Moses found, found himself astonished by what he saw on the outside and he dropped the two tablets of stone. So the next time God said, I'm not hewing it out for you, you got to hew it out for yourself. And once he got to hewing that rock all night long, he didn't drop that. <laughs> when God gets through taking you through what he's trying to take you through, I'm not going to have to worry about you dropping it because it costs you so much to get it that you're going to appreciate it and respect it. Come on, talk to me, somebody. All this took about 450 years after this. God gave them judges. God gave them judges. In fact, that's what the book of Judges is all about. And I've taught you before that God gave the children of Israel judges because he considered himself to be king. So he gave them judges to handle their day-to-day -day affairs, but he considered himself to be king, which is what a theocracy is. A theocracy as opposed to a democracy, a theocracy is a God-ruled nation. But because they started watching other people, and we have a voyeuristic church today that is watching other people and think that what they have is better than what you have, and you start lusting to be like other people and they will, they will seduce you into apostasy. They will draw you into losing the very unique thing that makes you who you are. When it's all right to appreciate what God has done in somebody else, but when you start imitating them, you have to forsake you in order to be them and that's too high of a price to pay. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel, the prophet. And I've been talking about Samuel for three days, for the three messages I preach leading up to this. Then the people asked for a king. They asked for a king. They had a king, but they asked for a king. God was their king, but they asked for a king. Be careful what you ask for. I only want what God wants me to have. I only want what God wants me to have. If you're single, you, are, you only want what God wants you to have. It could be that the Lord is your husband. 
and you might forsake him as your husband and get something that you want him to later take back. That goes for the brothers too. Are you with me today? I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with wanting to be married. I'm saying it's something great about being contented. There's something great about being contented because chances are if you're not contented by yourself, you're not going to be contented with anybody else. I might as well mess with you a little bit. And you're going to bring that discontentment into the relationship. And instead of you just being miserable, now you're going to make me miserable because I'm going to come into your atmosphere. If you're waiting on me to start preaching, I just did. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, the son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. Come on. After removing Saul, he made David their king. After removing Saul, he made David their king. While he was removing Saul, he was getting David ready. He was setting up the stage. He was causing certain things to happen in David's background to prepare him to go to a place that he could have never imagined. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David. You remember when I was preaching a Sunday and I told you that when God came into Samuel and Samuel was crying because Saul was rejected? You remember that? And I told you God asked Samuel, why weepest thou over what I have rejected? I have found me a man. While Samuel was crying, God was searching. You, you, you got to understand that. While you're all upset about what you see right now, God is already searching out a solution to your situation. After removing Saul, he made David their king. And we're going to talk a little bit about how this bridge occur, occurred. I, I preached in D.C. the transference of power. You, you, we're going to watch this transference occur. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. Good God of mercy. You know that's good when God testifies concerning you. I'm used to testifying concerning God. I didn't know that God would testify concerning me. God testified. God testified concerning him. I have found David. I have found David. Oh, it's so, the, 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 the language is so romantic. It, it, it's, it's like a lost lover. I have found David. I have found him, which means David was lost. It is not that David has found me. I have found David. David must have been something that God would search for him. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. That's a testimony. Can God say that about you? Can God say that about me? I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Is there anybody in here that's willing to do everything that God wants you to do? Somebody shout, I will do everything that God wants me to do. Give me my next verse. From this man's descendants, talking about David, from this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. He moved David to set up Jesus. 
There's some shifting going on in your life that doesn't even have anything to do with you. He will move you to set up the stage for what's going to happen years after you. You don't understand how important you are. It's not always important whether you got the position you were trying to get or the house you were trying to get. It's not always important whether you get the promotion you were trying to get. Sometimes God is shifting you and it's not even about you. Glory to God. He moved you for a reason. He shifted you for a reason. He set the stage for a reason. He let you get a degree for a reason. He let the loan be approved for a reason. He sent you to school for a reason. He's changing the trajectory of your family. He's breaking curses off of your descendants. He's changing your lineage. Glory to God. He's giving your grandchildren something to inherit. He's setting you up for a divine purpose. I feel the glory of the Lord in this place. I haven't even started yet. My God, I feel the anointing in this place. Shout amen, somebody. So God is up to something in the life of David. Let me pray it because I'm ready to take off and just go and get them all fired up and excited. But I feel the pace of the Lord in this place. I want one of the things I want you to sense, and I'm going to pray in a minute, one of the things I want you to sense is that God has a rhythm. While he's moving out one, he's moving in another. You can't be weeping over who left because while they're, while they're walking away, somebody is walking in. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Isn't that good? Isn't that good? God has a rhythm. Say that with me. God has a rhythm. God has a pace. God has a pace. Your whole life is on a rhythm. Your whole life. He's got a pace over your life. He's got a rhythm over your life. He's got a certain time to bless you. No devil, no witch, no hex, no spell, no setback, no layoff, no getting fired, no nothing can stop the pace of God in your life. God is the pacemaker. He is a pacemaker. Look at your neighbor and say, he is a pacemaker. Everything that's out of pace, God's going to bring it back into pace. God is a God of rhythm. God is a God of rhythm. Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you're about to do in this place. Have your way in this place today. Thank you for your word today. Thank you for what you're about to do in this place. Thank you for your power and your glory. Thank you for your anointing. Move, great God that you are, and I trust you for it. In Jesus' name, give him the best praise you got. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want you to understand, you may be seated, I want you to understand that God is a God of rhythm. That everything God does, he does by rhythm. God is a God of rhythm. Rhythm is about music. God is a God of rhythm. God is a God of rhythm. Everything God created has a rhythm to it. You have a rhythm. I was, I was at the uh, Wailing Wall in Jerusalem years ago, and when we got to the Wailing Wall, uh, all of the rabbis that come to the Wailing Wall, when they get to the wall, they don't stand still. They rock back and forth. They rock back and forth to indicate that God is a moving God. And if you're going to talk to him, you have to catch his rhythm. And they'll stand at the wall. The wall is solid, but the prayer, the prayer is rocking back and forth. He said the blood is rocking back and forth. Blood is moving through your body and it's rocking back and forth. And when they get ready to pray, they come to the wailing wall and they rock back and forth in the rhythm of God. When God hollowed out a lump of clay that would be Adam and breathed in him the breath of lives. He breathed a rhythm into him. He breathed a rhythm. Before there was a where or when or this or that, before there was a tree or a bush or a flower, before there was a column or a building or a house, in the beginning there was God, just the breath of the Almighty, the breath of... <sighs> <sighs> 
of the breath of the Almighty and out of the breathing of God comes the existing of humanity. And so when God the Creator scooped down a lump of clay and hovered over it as a hen would over its eggs, he took his breath and he breathed into Adam. He breathed not just air but rhythm. It's not enough to breathe air if you don't breathe rhythm. It is the rhythm that makes the air significant. And God had a rhythm and he breathed a rhythm into Adam. And Adam began to inhale and exhale in rhythm with God, in rhythm with God, in rhythm with God, in rhythm with God, in rhythm with God. You want to be in rhythm with God. You want to be in rhythm with God. You want to catch his rhythm. You want to catch his rhythm over the next few weeks. We want to get you in rhythm for 2019. We want to get you in rhythm. We don't want you to be out of rhythm. We want your heart in rhythm. We want your thinking in rhythm. We want your mind in rhythm. There's powerful things to be learned when we understand the rhythm of God. Peace exists in the rhythm of God. You'll stop trying to make things happen if you get in the rhythm of God. It happens when it's supposed to happen. It moves when it's supposed to move. It breaks when it's supposed to break. You stop being a manipulator when you get in the rhythm of God. Oh God, oh God, oh God, amen. There are witches in the house of God, witches who are, who are trying to enforce their will on other people. They don't even know that it's witchcraft, but your dominance and your manipulation is the spirit of witchcraft. The, th the reason that you think you can run everybody and run everything and you know what's best for everybody's life and you're all in their business. You don't know it, but you're a witch. That's what witchcraft is, is to try to control other people's lives. And, and your, your mouth is incantations and you're trying to make them do this and make them do that. And a humble person knows you don't hardly know what you ought to do. How dare you try to control what I ought to do? You don't even know what you're supposed to do. I break the spirit of witchcraft out of your life and out of your spirit. It's got to go. It's the spirit of witchcraft manipulating, manipulating, controlling, going here and there. Stop all of that and just get in the rhythm of God. Get in the rhythm of God. Help me get in the rhythm of God. Help me get in the rhythm of God. There is strength in the rhythm of God. There is peace in the rhythm of God. There is power in the rhythm of God. Touch your neighbor and say, get in the rhythm of God. All that I'm going to talk to you about today centers around rocks and rhythms. Rocks and rhythms. It's all rocks and rhythms. Rocks and rhythms. It's everything that happened is either through a rock or a rhythm. It's either through a rock or a rhythm. David would still be a shepherd boy if it weren't for a rock and a rhythm. Do you hear what I'm saying? A rock and a rhythm. A rock and a rhythm. That's what stands in between him and his destiny is a rock and a rhythm. It wasn't ambition. I don't believe that David was out there taking care of sheep saying, you know, I don't have no business out here. I should be king. If they, they need to acknowledge who I am. They need to recognize. It was not self-promotion. It was not self-aggrandizement. He had no idea that his destiny was going to be what it ended up being. I can be honest, I would have been shocked to know that I would end up here. I didn't plan to be here. I didn't expect to be here. I didn't feel like I deserved to be here. I would, I would, no, no, but a rock and a rhythm, a rock and a rhythm, a rock and a rhythm. I'm telling you this because some of the things you thought were going to happen in your life are not going to happen in your life because it was witchcraft in your life trying to control the outcome of your life and some of the things that you never expected to receive in all of your life God has in store for you. Let me get down because I got to prove it. I feel you kind of listening at me. I'm going to break it on down. God said your eyes have not seen. Your ears have not heard. 
neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for you. So it's not what you conjured up. It's not what you tried to make happen. It's not why you tried to manipulate people and tried to get your daughter to marry my son and your son to marry my daughter. Stop the witchcraft. Get out the way. Your eyes have not seen. Your ears have not heard, neither has entered into your heart the things that God has in store for them that love him. It's just going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen in a rock and a rhythm. <laughs> in a rock and a rhythm. 20 years ago, you didn't think you'd be in Dallas. It's a rock and a rhythm. You didn't plan it. You didn't figure it out. You didn't strategize it. It's a rock and a rhythm. What God has for you is going to blow your mind. It's going to surprise you. It's going to shock you. It's going to shock your neighbors and your friends. You never see it coming. But just in the process of being who you are, you're going to stumble up on stuff. You're going to step in the stuff. You, oh, God, do you hear what I'm saying? Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. A rock and a rhythm. Say that with me. A rock and a rhythm. Say it again. A rock and a rhythm. Say it again. A rock and a Who would think that a rock and a rhythm would have anything to do with who would be the next king? But if you will allow me today, I will show you that the bridge to David's destiny was a rock and a rhythm. The bridge between where he was and where he was to go was a rock and a rhythm. God gives to us in Acts, and I chose Acts over going into 1 Samuel, God gives to us in summary the criteria of his promotion. Here God reveals his criteria for selecting the next king. I found me a man, he says. I found me a man. I'm going to make him king. Not because of the university he matriculated from. Not because he was raised up in the castle, in the palace. Not because he understands the protocol of magistrates and rich men. Not because everybody thinks that he'll make the next king. Not because he's tall and good looking. Not because he looks like Saul. Not because he's been serving Saul. Not because he's been in the right place at the right time. Not because he goes to the right parties and he knows the right people. Not because he plays kissy kissy and politics. All of that is witchcraft. I'm breaking the spirit of witchcraft. I'm breaking the spirit of witchcraft. I'm breaking the spirit of witchcraft. Anything you have to do yourself, you have to maintain yourself. Except the Lord build the house. Say that labor, labor but in vain that build it. Oh, it's going to come through a rock and a rhythm. Somebody say a rock and a rhythm. God says, I am going to make you a king because you're the son of Jesse. Because you're, number one, providence, because you're the son of Jesse. I didn't just start working on this when you got here. I sent your great-great-grandmother Naomi To Moab, I designed for Naomi to lose her son. I meant for her to lose her son, both of them, and her husband, so that in bitterness she would give up on Moab and move back to Bethlehem and her grieving daughter-in-law would follow her home. Orpah didn't go because she wasn't in the plan.
Oh, I love preaching to you because you get it. You get it so quick. You understand that all that left you couldn't stay. And all that stayed couldn't leave. Because God doesn't just start setting it up when you start praying before you have any idea what is going on. Oh, God, do you have, Naomi had no idea that she was being blessed while she was being broken. That her grieving broken heart and the bitterness in her spirit was a part of a greater thing that God meant for her to be hurt. He meant for her to give up on Moab. He meant for her to move out of her house. He meant for her to feel dejected and rejected and go home. He meant for Orpah to say, I'm not going with you. He meant for Ruth to fall so in love with her that she couldn't leave her. And Ruth said, thy God shall be my God and thy people shall be my people and where thou dwellest, I will dwell, and where thou diest, I shall die. That kind of love doesn't just happen. It's a setup. Anytime somebody falls in love with you and they can't leave you and they think they see something in you that nobody else saw in you, it's a setup. God causes people's hearts. Boom, 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 boom. God causes people's hearts to be drawn to you or repel from you. Accept it. Accept it when they come and accept it when they go. It is the Lord's doors and it's marvelous in your eyes. Stop feeling bad about yourself. Stop blaming yourself. Stop faulting yourself. Orpah couldn't stay. She's not a part of your destiny. She's not a part of your destiny, and every imposter will fall away from your destiny. They're not a part of your destiny. They're not a part of your destiny. And if you try to hold them, you're going to bring trouble on yourself. When they want to go, let them go. See, all of my Bible readers know where I'm at. Those of you that don't know your Bible, you're trying to figure out what this has to do with what I'm talking about. You see, you see Naomi was to be the great, 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 great grandmother of David. And she had to go to Bethlehem, number one. Incidentally, Bethlehem was where Jesus was to be born. Thousands of years later, and even though she goes back to Bethlehem crying over her dead husband, God is setting up the place and pointing to the place where Christ would be born. It's all a setup. Touch your neighbor and say, it's all a setup. Some of you all did, had no idea you would end up in Dallas. It's all a setup. It's all a setup. It's a setup. It's a setup. So Naomi comes home with, with Ruth, her daughter-in-law. They're not even related. They're not even of the same people. Ruth is a Gentile. Ruth is a Gentile. She's a Moabite. Ruth is a Gentile. Ruth is not even a part of the covenant. She's not even of the same ethnicity. Stop thinking that God only uses people who look like you. <laughs> God will use white folks and brown folks and all kind of folks and folks that speak different languages. He'll make connections across bridges that you never thought possible to, in order to fulfill his destiny. God has a plan for your life. Therefore, we glory in tribulation, for tribulation work of patience. I know you get hurt sometimes, but while you're crying, praise him too, because the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. God, help me. My God, my God, I'm talking to somebody. I don't even know who it is. 
I was going through something one time, it really crushed me, it broke me. It really, really broke me like I've never been broken before. And I was walking down in the field behind my house and I was crying and I was hurt. And it looked like I was gonna be totally destroyed and totally consumed and I was worried and I was concerned. And while I was crying, I told God, I said, God, I, I'm in pain and I'm suffering, but I trust you. I know you wouldn't allow this to happen if it weren't going to be for my good. I don't like it. I don't understand it. I don't want it, but I still trust you. And when I said I trust you, I know hell got seasick and demons started throwing up. Glory to God, because I still trust him. In pain, I trust him. In a, oh, oh God. In affliction, I trust him. In trials, I trust him. In loneliness, I trust him. In rejection, I trust him. All of these years, he made everything work together for my good. So even when it doesn't feel good, it's going to work together. You, 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 you got to have a strong constitution in the base of your soul that you believe God. I'm not talking about this churchy stuff, this hooping and the hollering stuff. I'm talking about way down in your gut, in your belly, when all hell is breaking loose. You got to know that he that has begun a good work in you shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And though he slay me, Though he slay me, though I'm crying, though I'm wounded, though I'm burning, yet shall I trust him. And so God is setting up the stage. He lets us know this is a criteria for the king's selection. You are the son of Jesse. I didn't just start this with you. This did not begin with you. This started before you got here. This started before your grandmother met your grandfather. God was getting you ready for what's about to happen in your life. Do you understand what I'm saying? It didn't just start with you. 16 years old, they buried my father. I felt like a failure. He'd been sick since I was 10. My mother and I had driven back and forth to the hospital. I could, I could literally run a kidney machine and couldn't ride a bicycle. While other little kids was playing in the yard, I was in the house mopping up blood, running a kidney machine, taking care of my father. All I've ever known all my life was taking care of other people. And when he died, I felt like a failure because he died. He slipped out of my fingers and he was gone. And worse than just feeling like a failure, I felt confused because he died without telling me who I am and what he thought of me and what I could do and what I could be and how I could fly and did you even like me? And I didn't even understand anything and I was crying and they were lowering his body in the grave and I didn't understand it when I was 16. I didn't understand it when I was 17. I didn't understand it when I was 18. I didn't understand it when I was 19. I didn't understand it when I was 20. All of a sudden as I got older I began to realize that it was the loss of my father that made me seek the Holy Ghost that made me get in the Word of God. If I were not broken like that, I wouldn't have had the inordinate hunger that I had. That's why they called me the Bible boy. I didn't have nothing else to read. I used to put my Bible in my science book in high school and sneak and read the scriptures because I was trying to find my daddy. And while I was looking for Ernest L, I found Elohim. You understand what I'm saying? God knows what it takes to push you into his purpose. So God said, I chose you because you are the son of Jesse. Number two, he says, I have found a man that is after my heart. I found a man that is after 
my heart. Now, there's been a lot of confusion about this scripture because people say, how could David be after God's heart? Because uh, David had some issues. I mean, I'm not trying to castigate him or run his name down, but David had some issues. And, 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 and church people don't understand this, but everybody who's, who I've ever met who was greatly gifted or greatly anointed was also greatly conflicted. P people don't tell you stuff like that because that don't sound good, but that's how it is. They're greatly conflicted. It's never a straight line. In writing novels about character development, they teach you to never write a character that's all good or all bad because it's not a reflection of reality. Good people have bad issues. Bad people have good sides. I don't understand how she could stay with him, his good side. I wish I had an honest sister in here that you see something in that Negro that nobody else saw in the world and, and he crazy and he's ignorant and he drive you crazy, but he bakes you cookies every Friday night and brings them to the bed and you say, I love you anyway. Harpo, you crazy, but I love you anyway. You married that girl, she talks too much, she shakes her neck, she bobs her head, but when you're in trouble, she fights for you and stands up for you, and you put up with what you don't want because of what, that's real life. Real life is messy. Real life is confusing. Real life is muddy. It's never a straight line. Stop thinking that there are good people and bad people. There are just people. They're just people. They're just people. They're just people. They're just people. And when God, when they, God says, I found a man after my own heart, people freak out because the man that he found that was after his own heart ended up sleeping with Uriah's wife. The man who was after God's own heart slept with Uriah's wife. The man who was after God's own heart killed Uriah. Set him up and had him murdered. And it just burns your religious ears to hear that, that God could love somebody so nasty. But I don't know why it burns your ears, because he loved you. <laughs> he loved your little filthy self. I don't understand why you need to read it in the Greek and the Hebrew. I don't understand why you got grace for your situation and no grace for mine. I just don't understand it, it just confuses me. And he didn't stumble into God, God searched him out. I have found me a man who is after my heart. And besides, the text doesn't mean that David is a pattern of God's heart. First of all, it, it implies to us that David has God's rhythm. He got a beat like mine. Wow. He's passionate like me. I have found a man who is after my heart. He's chasing my heart. I found a man who's writing me poetry and singing me songs on the mountaintops. I found a man who's dating me and dancing on the hills. See, David would be up in the hills and in the mountaintop, Thou art my God, I love you, Lord, I bless your name. God said, I found him, he's after me, he's chasing me, he's wooing me, he's flirting with me, he keeps saying sweet stuff to me. I have found a man who is after my heart. I'm going to make him king because he praises me. He he won't stop blessing my name. He won't stop lifting me up. He won't stop giving me the glory. I have found a man who is after my heart. That's why you don't want to be a stiff-necked brother who won't open his mouth or clap his hands or praise the Lord. 
because if you are after God's heart, he will promote you, not because of your degree, but because you are after his heart. Don't let anybody else tell you that it's masculine to be stony-faced and sit up here and look like your cat just died. No, 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 God said, I have found this man who flirts with me. Who keeps talking to me? Who keeps praising me? Who keeps searching me out? He lifts his hands. He writes me songs. He does poetry to me. I'm going to make him king because he's after me. He's aggressive. He's tenacious. He's relentless. He won't leave me alone. He keeps flirting with me early in the morning. He wakes up seeking my face. He's calling on my name. I'm going to bring him from the background to the forefront because he's after my heart. I wish I had a thousand praising men. Yes, yes, yes. If you praise him, God will find you. 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 You're lost, but if you praise him, God will find you. If you praise him, God will fix you. If you praise him, God will heal you. Open your mouth. Leave your traditions behind. God said, I found me a man who is after my heart. You got one thing going for you. You're after his heart. It's not that you're smart. It's that you're after his heart. It's not that you're disciplined. It's that you're after his heart. And God protected you because you were after his heart. And he opened doors for you. And he made ways for you because there's one thing consistent about you. Your heart is toward God. When your heart is toward God, he will make your enemies your footstools. Lord, I'm weak, but I love you. Lord, I'm broke, 
but I love you. Lord, I messed up, but I love you. Lord, I'm a crackpot, but I love you. If you praise him, he'll deliver you from crack. He'll pull you out the street. He'll turn your life around. Sit down, I gotta go on. I'm still in Roman number one. <laughs> That's why you're never gonna get me to stop praising God. I praised him when I was on welfare. I praised him when I had food stamps. I praised him when Wes Womack had to drive me to church and I didn't even have a car, I praised him then. So when I got my Mercedes, I praised him then. And when he gave me my Bentley, I praised him then. Cause I said, I'll let nothing separate me from the love of God. No matter what you give me, I'm still gonna give you the praise. I'll praise you in a Brioni suit. Y'all don't wanna talk to me. Some of you have gotten so rich that you sit there with your cute self forgetting it was God that gave you everything you got. Woo! Touch your neighbor and say, I'm after his heart. I'm after his heart. If I don't get you, I'm after his heart. If you don't like me, it's okay. I'm after his heart. I'm after his heart. I'm trying to get him. I'm trying to woo him. I'm trying to date him. I'm trying to flirt him. I'm trying to get his attention. Hey, I'm over here. Check this out. Want some of this? Hey, here I am, Jesus. Let me go on. The next thing that God says, God says, the third thing God says, he will do whatever I want him to do. I chose him because he won't fight me. I chose him because he won't fight me. I chose him because he'll obey me. I chose him because he'll submit to me. He will do whatever I want him to do. I can send him anywhere. I can do anything in his life. I chose him because he's pliable in my hands. I chose him because he's clay. I'm the potter, he's the clay. I can shape him. I can break him. He will do whatever I want him to do. Dr. James might not remember this, but several years ago, we were sitting around the table at my house having dinner, and she made a statement I will never forget the rest of my life. She said, after years of reading the Bible, she said, I've come to realize that God is guided by his purpose. That in order to accomplish his purpose, he will use anybody or anything yeah. to get done what he's trying to get done. You, re you remember us having that conversation? Yeah, we, oh God, I'll never forget it as long as I live. She said, she said, in order to accomplish his purpose, he used prostitutes and hookers, street people, people who didn't have nothing. He used kings and princes and tax collectors and bill collectors and people that everybody hated in order to accomplish his purpose. So if you get in his purpose, He'll always protect you, not because you deserve it, but because you will do whatever he wants you to do. Somebody throw your hands up and say, I'll do it. <clears throat> when he called me to preach, I told him, I said, Lord, you can find people that are more able, but you will find nobody more willing. I told him that 40 years ago. I said, I'm willing. I'm just willing. I'm not able. I'm willing. I don't know why you want me, but I'm willing. I'm not qualified, but I'm willing. 
And I said, if you'll give, you, if you'll give me your able, I'll give you my willing. It's bad to be stubborn. You miss opportunities being stubborn. You get passed over being stubborn. Why should God wrestle with you to get you to do something that she will just do? And then you become a hater of her because she's doing what you could have done, but you were too stubborn. You was a strong woman. No, you was a stupid woman. You missed an opportunity to step into your destiny. Sometimes being tough is not a blessing. Sometimes being tough is not a blessing. He said, I made David king because he'll obey me. Number four, I made him king because he's got Jesus in his legacy. When I'm, this is what I want you to get. When I move David from the sheepfold to the palace, I move Jesus. <laughs> see, see, Jesus is David's great, 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 great grandchild. And even though Jesus was born in a barn, his destiny wasn't to be sheep. David moved from the sheep field into the palace so that when Jesus said, I am the son of David, it would have a royal ring to it. He moved the whole family to the throne to start a dynasty for a child David had never met. You with me? You with me? Now, now, I want you to see this. You, you cannot bridge where you are into where you're supposed to be without finding your battle. Your battle is your bridge. It wasn't that David attended the right parties. It wasn't that he had the right business cards. It wasn't that he went out and got him a Brioni suit that he couldn't pay for so he looked like something that he wasn't. What got him promoted was his battle. Your battle is your bridge. If you don't get anything else, you got to get this. Your battle is your bridge. Every David needs a Goliath. Nobody would have known David if it wasn't for Goliath. Goliath put David on the map. We don't get to choose our own battle. The stage that brings you to your destiny is generally an uncomfortable one. Y'all with me? You will normally have inadequate equipment. You'll be ill-equipped for the fight you're in. Are you following what I'm saying? And the other thing I want you to understand, you'll have an inordinate confidence. You'll think you can do something that don't make any sense. So you got poor equipment, but you got great confidence. <laughs> you cocky. And other people, it looks crazy. When David found his Goliath, he said, I'm gonna tear him up. I'm gonna tear him, I'm gonna tear, I'm gonna tear him. He, it looked so stupid that Goliath started laughing. <laughs> Goliath said, who am I, a dog, that you would come at me with, with a rock? A rock.
a rock and a rhythm. You're a stone's throw away from your destiny. You're a stone's throw away from your destiny. And the greatest blessing you could ever have is to find your Goliath. All the disciples could have walked away from Jesus and he'd have been okay, except Judas. Judas did more for Jesus than all the other disciples combined. It was Judas that created the stage that set Jesus on course for his destiny. It's not your friends that bless you, it's your haters. It's your haters that bless you. It's Goliath that blessed David. Goliath created a platform for him. In fact, when God got ready to reveal David, he sent Goliath. Goliath is the enemy that David's destiny had been waiting on. Something big enough to fight. Something bad enough to fight. Something that you had to fight in front of everybody. This isn't a secret battle, this is a public fight. This is a dog fight and everybody's talking about you and everybody can see you. Oh, Goliath. They would have never been talking about David if it wasn't for Goliath. Before the day was over, everybody was talking about David. Because of Goliath, God will use your enemies as a footstool. So if you push all your enemies away, you're pushing your destiny away because every David needs a Goliath. The bridge to your destiny is going to come through your enemy. You'll know you're ready for the next stage when Goliath comes. Goliath is the usher to the next dimension. When you find your Goliath, you're going to step into your kingdom. And here comes David down there to the battlefield with inadequate equipment. He doesn't have everything he needs because Goliath does. All David had was a rock. Now he needed a sword. He didn't have a sword. Saul tried to give him a sword. He wouldn't take Saul's sword. He ran down there with nothing but a rock. He threw what he had, even though it wasn't enough. It was enough to get it started. You might not have enough money to pay it off. Y'all, see, see, you gotta be a little bit crazy to catch the rhythm of God, to get in his pace. I threw what I had at this building. Timberland, I threw what I had at this building. It wasn't enough. No banks would give us no money. I threw what I had, a few million dollars. I threw it at the building. We dug out the foundation, got everything ready. And all the banks that were talking to us said no. And I drove past it every week and told God, I ain't worried about it. I, I drove right past it. I told him, I said, listen, I don't need that building. I don't have but five kids. You need that building. So you're going to have to pay for it. If you don't pay for it, I'm going to turn it into a swimming pool. I'm not going to worry about it. The battle is not mine. It belongs to God. I threw what I had. (laughs) 
Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I threw what I had at it. I got on the phone and I started calling some friends of mine in high places and they started calling the presidents of the banks and the same Goliath that said I couldn't have the money, now they're all fighting over who's going to give me the money. So I was able to fill, finish building, I can't even remember what this was, about $83 million building with somebody else's money. You're going to use somebody else's sword. To those of you who don't realize it, David knocked him down with the rock, but he cut his head off with his own sword. He, he, cut, he cut Goliath's head off with Goliath's sword. If you throw your rock, you can finish it up with your enemy's sword. Do y'all hear what I'm saying to you? Touch your neighbor and say, Goliath is holding your sword. Stop running from him. Stop running from him. You're going to kill your enemy with his own sword. Okay? Can I go a little bit deeper? I'm ready to go deeper. My next point I want to show you is theocracy trumps democracy. Theocracy trumps democracy. Nobody believed in David. Nobody supported David. Nobody voted for David. Nobody suspected that he was the one. You don't need everybody's consensus to underwrite your next move. Stop calling everybody to get them on your side to do what you're trying to do. Theocracy always trumps democracy. If God says you can do it, you can do it. If God says you can have it, you can have it. If God says you can build it, you can build it. If God says you can make it, you can make it. It doesn't matter what your mama said, what Aunt Chris said, what Uncle Richie said, what bruh said, what sis said, what your neighbor said. You don't need democracy. You need theocracy. If God be for you, he's more than the world against you. The only person that believed in David was God. Stop running around trying to get people to believe in you. You're fighting the wrong battle. You don't need to convince them that you're able. This is between you and God. Now I want you to get this because this is important. The soldiers didn't believe in him. The king didn't believe in him. His brothers didn't believe in him. His father didn't even like him. So stop feeling sorry for yourself and saying, if my father liked me, then my mother wouldn't support me, and if my sister didn't do what she did, I'd have been so much, shut up! That's an excuse. They have nothing to do with it. I can't tell you how many people got successful with nasty mamas. I can't tell you how many people got successful with drunk daddies. I can't tell you how many people was abused and molested and still became king. Get rid of your excuse. That is not the problem. You don't need democracy. You don't, you don't need everything lining up in order for you to win. There are people in this room that succeeded though they were hated. In fact, every person who has succeeded in some area of your life though you were hated, holla at your boy right now. people are testimonies that the odds can be against you but if God is for you you can still succeed I need 30 seconds of crazy praise
Say this with me. This is my year, is my year to, cross my to cross my bridge. That means your enemy is your bridge. Your Goliath is your bridge. You're not running from Goliath no more. You're not hiding from Goliath. You see Goliath as an opportunity. God sent Goliath to you to promote you. Goliath is your platform. The problem is your promise. What's wrong is what's right. If we didn't have a criminal justice problem, we wouldn't need a Tina Nado. We wouldn't need you. The problem created you. The problem hired you. The problem gave you the job. The worse it is, the better it is. The more relevant you become, you become relevant because of a problem you came to kill. The hand of the Lord is on you. When you find your problem, you found your answer. <laughs> what were you born to fix? What were you born to fix? Woo! I'm getting happy. I shouldn't get happy, but I'm getting happy. I'm getting happy. What were you born to fix? I can do this. I can do this all day because I was born to fix this. I can do this tired. I can do this sick. I can do this broke because I was born to fix this. The more messed up you are, the more anointed I become. I'm better when you're in a mess. I was born to fix this. I found my Goliath. Every David needs to find your Goliath. This is your bridge to your destiny. A rock and a rhythm. Can I show you something else? Sit down, I'm gonna show you the second part. I'm gonna show you the second part. This is what you get when you get David. And I want you to understand, I'm setting the tone. You won't wanna miss, for the next few weeks, I'm, you won't, I'm set, I, see, I ain't even got to the point. I'm, I'm, set, I'm, I'm setting you up. I'm setting you up a big, 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 because <laughs> I can't show you David's tabernacle till I show you David. You got to understand what it was about him. David did something that really was illegal. He, he established a way of reaching God that wasn't even biblical. All the rules that Moses established, David broke all of them. Because he found a higher principle. And I'm trying to show you how to step into a higher principle. Before I could take you to the higher principle, I had to show you the lower principle. Moses' tabernacle is the lower principle. David's tabernacle is the higher principle. Do you understand what I'm saying? And in order for me to show you what David's tabernacle is, I, I can't, I can't, you, you look at this building, you look at what I built, but you'll never be able to build it until you look at who built it. Because this ministry is my baby. It came out of me. And you'll never be able to do it until you understand the me it came out of. You can wear my suits, but you can't do it. You can walk like me, but you can't do it. You can preach in my church, but you can't do it. Because out of your belly, I shall fall. can only birth out of you what's inside of you. So I'm showing you David 
so that when I get to the tabernacle, you will understand what he brings. He's a fighter. He's a fighter. He killed a lion. He killed a bear. When he came in front of Goliath, he said, I kill you too. <laughs> Never mind I don't have the money. Never mind I don't have the help. Never mind they talking about me. If God be for me, he's more than a word. I'll kill you. Come here. You uncircumcised Philistines. I'll kill you dead. I'll kill you in front of everybody. He's a fighter. That's my rock. My fight is my rock. I'll throw this rock at you. I hit you in your head. You fall in the day. Your rock is your fight. You got to have fight. You got to have fight. It's nice to be nice. Nice is cute and nice is good and nice is wonderful. But when the devil after you, you better, you better have some fight. There's a difference between being mean and having fight. I've seen people that were mean, but they didn't have no fight. Fight doesn't have nothing to do with your personality. It has something to do with your tenacity, your conviction, your commitment. Come hell or high water, you fight me, you knock me down, I'll bite your ankles. I'll fight you back. I don't care you can box, I can bite. It ain't got to be pretty. It ain't got to be pretty. I put my finger in your eye. It ain't got to be something you put on Sports Channel. Long as you understand to leave me alone, we good. Look at somebody in the hall, fight back! Now, let me show you something. I'm going to show you something. <laughs> yeah, fight back. Yeah, fight back. Fight back. It's a rock. And I showed you the rock. You got to have a fight. But, but, but the thing that people never tell you about, they talk about the shepherd boy being coming king. But they never tell you that David was a musician. Come on now. David was a musician. And now here come my rhythm. See, see, music creates mood. It produces sound. And sound is measurable. Sound has impact. Before it's over, I'm going to teach you why God says make a joyful noise. He didn't just write that for people who can't sing. <laughs> noise moves God. You remember when God told the children of Israel to march around the wall seven times, seven days? He said, when you go around the seventh time, shout. <laughs> You're going to want to come back next week. I got some more for you. I got some more for you. But I got to lay this foundation because I got to give you a rhythm. I want you, first, first of all, I want you to play me something classical. You see how that changed the mood of the whole room? Music is the cheapest way to redecorate the house without moving the furniture.
You don't have to get new drapes or new carpet or anything. You don't have to re-upholster the couch or nothing. If you play music, you redecorated the whole room because music changes the atmosphere. He played classical music and a whole different mood came over the whole house because music has power to change the unseen. Play me some jazz. What he did, he played a worship song with jazz chords. Jazz chords are notes that are d diminished, like sevenths that are lowered, a third create a jazz sound. So whenever you get ready to hear jazz, it is the lowering of the seventh chord that creates what is called a jazz chord that changes the sound, that changes the mood. And so even though he was playing a gospel song, he was playing it with jazz chords, and it felt like jazz, but you heard the melody, which sounded like church, and you were trying to figure out which one was was it because he was playing jazz chords to a church song. Give me something in minor chords, minor chords, lower thirds. Now, my, you, you see how that changed the mood? Minor chords are lower thirds. When you lower the third of the chord, it's a minor chord. When, it, when, you, when you create the sound of a minor chord, it has this gothic sound to it. Yeah, yeah. Did you hear that gothic sound to it? Gothic chords are minor chords. And when it creates a, like, shalom, my brother, shalom, my sister, shalom, shalom. I give you love, I give you peace, shalom. Shalom, shalom, my brother, shalom, my sister, shalom, shalom, I give you love, I give you peace, shalom, shalom, that's minor, you see, you see, so, so, sound creates new auras of thought. New aura. Take me to church, to gospel, straight to sanctified church. Now you in the same room with the same people and you got the same musician creating different sounds that creates different moods that completely does the metamorphosis to the atmosphere. When he took me to church, all the old school church folk jumped up right away because your spirit recognized that sound. Sound moves spirit. Sound moves spirit. Spirit, sound moves spirit, sound moves spirit, say it, sound moves spirit, say it again, 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 give him a praise, give him a praise, give him a praise. The second bridge is sound. 
It's sound, it's sound, it's sound, it's sound. The, the, the sound is going to become a bridge. It is the sound. It is the sound you make that becomes a bridge. Jesus couldn't die as long as he was making sound. Oh, God. As long as he was making sound, he couldn't die. Because in his mouth were the words of eternal life. He couldn't die as long as he was talking because life was in his mouth. So when he hung his head in the locks of his shoulders, the Bible said he never said a mumbling word. He never said a mumbling word so he could die. <laughs> if he'd have kept talking, he couldn't have been able to die. You remember when he told Peter, he said, Peter, will thou leave me also? Peter said, whether shall we go in thy hands are the words of eternal life? He said, I can't leave you because you speak life to me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Without Him talking, nothing was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the Word was made flesh, the sound was made flesh, the abstract was made concrete, the invisible was made visible. God does it with sound, and God stepped out on nothing, and God said, Let there be lights. And when those sounds came out, formations appeared. Because sound is power. I'm going to show you this one thing, and then I'm going to stop. You with me? Go to Samuel. Go to Samuel. I see, what is it? Uh, 1 Samuel 16. <coughs> yeah, 1 Samuel 16, 13 through 21. I'm going to show you how God how God, and to the best of my ability, and why God brings David into the castle. You see, David is a musician. Why are you trying to say, make noise? Make noise. You too quiet. All you people who wrestle with depression, I guarantee you, if you're wrestling with depression, you're quiet in the house. Depression comes in silence. In order for it to rest in your house, you have to shut up. You have to shut up. You have to take all the music out your house. You have to walk around in quiet. Because like a fungus, it festers in the silence. The power of life and death is in your tongue. If I'm going to take you out, I got to get you to shut up. Look at somebody and say, make a noise. <laughs> Have you ever seen the paramedics when they come in and somebody been shot and they're standing over the victim and the victim's about to black out and they say, stay with me, stay with me. Keep talking, stay with me. Keep talking, stay with me. Keep talking, stay with me. Because as long as you're talking, you can't pass out. Oh! Touch your neighbor's head, open your mouth. Sound is spirit and spirit is sound. Sound is spirit and spirit is sound. Sound is spirit, and spirit is sound. Sound is spirit, and spirit is sound. Sound can affect objects. Sound can shatter glass. Sound can crack a mirror. Sound can break a demon. Sound can... That boy wrote that song, uh, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Yeah. Every time I hear it, I get happy. I don't even know what I'm happy about. <laughs> Every time I hear it, I just get happy. I just start getting happy. I just get happy and say, don't worry, be happy, be happy. I just say, okay. I just get happy. <laughs> sound has spirit. The spirit has sound. All David's life, he's been a musician, and he doesn't even know why. 
Let me show you this. Put my text up. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel wrote, this is, this is right where I left you last Sunday when, when I told you, take your horn and fill it and go. Samuel now has taken that horn. That's that same horn. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, being David, in the midst of his brother. Glory to God. I could preach about that. I don't have time to worry with it. Glory to God. When God anoints you in front of the very people who said you wasn't nothing, it does something for you. And, and the Spirit of the Lord, watch this, watch this. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Come on. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Wow. The same time the Spirit of the Lord came upon David, it departed from Saul. Because both of us can't be anointed to be king at the same time. Saul may have the position, but David has the power. Watch this, watch this, this is good. I'm gonna make you fall in love with your Bible. When I get through teaching you, you're gonna run home and read your Bible. Your Bible has got the answer to 90% of the problems that are going on in your life. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit, an evil spirit from the Lord. <clears throat> so when David got the Spirit of God, Saul got a devil. That part wasn't what got me. What got me was God sent it to him. Now let me explain this to you because I don't want to lose you. God isn't evil, but he commands it. You remember in the book of Job when the sons of God came around the throne and the Bible said among them were Satan? And God said to Satan, Lucifer, where have you been? And he said, I've been going to and fro up and down throughout the earth. And then God said, have you considered my servant Job, who is a faithful, upright man? And then Lucifer said, I've considered him, but I cannot curse him, seeing as you have a hedge around him. If you move the hedge from around him, I will make him curse you to your face. And God said, I'm going to move the hedge around him, but you can't have his soul. Then Lucifer departed and attacked Job's life. That evil spirit came from the Lord. The Lord allowed that evil spirit to have access. I'm just teaching the Bible. Put that text back up here again because I want them to say I didn't make it up. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Read on. And so I'm, I'm saying read on like somebody else is reading. <laughs> I better go home and go to bed and get some rest. I'm telling me to read on. Now you know I got issues. Jesus. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Come on. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp, and it shall come to pass, and it shall come to pass, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servant, who you gonna get that can play well and bring him to me? Then answered one of the servants, then answered one of the servants, do you see how this demon created a platform for David's gifting to operate? Watch this. Then answered one of his servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. 
that is cunning in playing and a mighty valiant man. He can fight too. He killed a giant and he's prudent in business. He's smart and he's nice looking too. And the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, send me David, thy son, which is with the sheep. Now David is taking care of sheep, but he's now anointed to be king. The anointing has fallen on him. He's anointed to do more than his situation will allow. But God said your gift will make room for you and bring you before great men. I want to talk to some gifted people. Watch this. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David, his son, unto Saul. Come on. And David came to Saul. And David came to Saul. And what is came to what was. <laughs> and David came to Saul and stood before him. And he loved him greatly. And he became his armor bearer. Well, well, well. You see how God slipped him into the kingdom? Now this is your year that God is going to slip you into places. This, this is the word of the Lord concerning you. God is going to create problems that make your gift important. He's going to create the tension that makes people who would normally reject you sin for you. I'm talking to gifted people. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm telling you, you got a gift that looks like it has nothing to do with your destiny. But it's going to lead you to your destiny. Who picks a king because he can play good music. My son went away to get a degree in music engineering. And he says to me, Daddy, I think music is what I want to do the rest of my life. And I want to get a degree in music. Will you send me to school? I said, I'll send you to school for four years to get your degree in music. He sat at the table and he said, but Daddy, I'm not sure that it's the thing I'm going to end up doing. I just love it. But what happens if I give four years to it and it's not the thing that I was created to do? I said, go anyway. Because if it's not the thing, it'll be the thing that leads to the thing. You don't have to worry about being misplaced or misguided. If you're misplaced, God's going to find you. If you're misguided, it's going to be the thing that leads to the thing. Who would have thought that playing a harp for a bunch of sheep would have brought David to the palace? I came to tell you that you've been doing something that everybody's been ignoring, that God is going to use in 2019 to shine a spotlight on a gift that don't even look like it's related. Everybody who receives that word, jump up on your feet and give him a praise. for David's tabernacle. We're getting ready to understand who David is. And when I tell you to give God a praise, I'm glad that you clap 
but your lips are closed. I want you to make a noise under God. the glory in this place you feel that glory in this place it didn't come from the rooftop it didn't come from the light switches it came out of your belly it came out of your shout it came out of your praise wherever you are wherever you are you can be in prison you can be locked up in jail but if you make a noise at midnight God has sent an angel to shake your prison. God's about to shake somebody out of your situation. A shake out, a shake out. How many people are glad you came to church this morning? 